Right. So um, our usual lead for these sorts of undergraduate seminars, Dan Zevin, he's got tied up, he's in transit, and so I'll just be filling in inadequately for him. Um, but I'll introduce, I'll let you guys introduce yourselves. But I do know your name is Lily, and she's, she's been my lead contact on this. I encourage her to come up and share the work that these folks in one of the aerospace engineering clubs down on campus have been doing uh, with actual rocket science as opposed to science with rockets, which is what we're <laughs> these are actually, you know, if you talk about rocket science, here's some rocket science. Um, I've had the opportunity to start working with the space enterprise folks Last year, I worked with a couple of the other clubs. Thank you, thank you, Robert. And, <laughs> um, and I gotta say, that was neither rockets nor science. That was, that was AV. That was resolving AV, which is even worse. You know, we should say it's not AV, probably. Okay. Anyway, um, yeah, I gotta say, working with these this particular population of engineers and scientists you know en you know engineers and training scientists and training is really phenomenal um the, the level of ambition and dedication and then skill that they build in these projects just flabbergasting i'm just fully amazed. but anyway i'm gonna let you guys go ahead and get started take it away seb let's go okay thank you for the introduction Hello everyone, welcome We're from Space and Friends at Berkeley. Thanks to SSL for inviting us today. It's always like, super exciting to be able to share our passion for rock tree. My name is Lily Essenbach. I'm a third year mechanical engineering student and I'm the president of SETL. My name is William Bradford. I'm the chief engineer. Um, I'm Asa Garner. Uh, I lead the structures team. I'm also a mechanical engineering student. And I'm Andy Kate. I'm the avionics lead at SETL. Okay, let's get started. So what is SETL? Space Enterprise at Berkeley is a team of around 70 members from all backgrounds, majors, and years. Our mission as a team is to become the first ever cogent team in the entire world to reach space with a liquid fuel rocket. To put that in perspective, not only has no cogent team achieved that, but only a few countries have done it. So truly a real challenge, and I like to compare it to a mini space race. So in the process, we have completed 10 launches and 17 static fires. Our most recent achievement is the successful launch of Eureka 1, which soared to 11,000 feet in the Mojave Desert last December and set the path ahead for Eureka 2 and Eureka 3, our space shot. So let's look back at a few images of how that launch went. Oh. Uh oh. Okay. <laughs> Apologies. Still figuring out the system here. Okay. Pause the yeah. There you go. There you go. <laughs> so just a little overview, as you can see, very exciting, and a lot of work happened just to get to that launch. So something very special about SEV is our very fast-paced environment and our constant push for innovation. Here are some of the key milestones we only hit last year and like for a year and a year and a half. And as you can see, there's a lot of stuff. So our key milestone mainly comprised of lab launches, so a low-altitude administrator, a series of solar rockets on which we test our avionics and recovery systems, and then as well, many hot fires, which ultimately led to the launch of Eureka 1. Overall, the developments of Eureka 1 span over three years in the work of multiple sub-teams. Our three main sub-teams are propulsion, avionics, and structures. I let the leads here tell you more about their work. Good. Okay, uh, first up is simulation. So this is where prop begins, is the stage in which we're trying to set the goals for our systems. Uh, so say we want to reach a certain altitude mark. Uh, for Eureka 1, this critical altitude goal was 30,000 feet. Uh, and so sort of 
what performance do we need to get out of this system to reach that altitude goal? And that's what simulations is about, is going through making mathematical physics-based models just to verify our system after we've tested, but also design our system uh, before we've tested. So you can see here, we use primarily MATLAB and Simulink, if you're familiar with those. And up on the right there uh, is one of our physics-based models of uh, the trajectory of our system. There's a lot more to this sim. Uh, well, we include engine performance and engine uh, characterization. And since this is a pressure-fed system, all sorts of pressures and flow rates that we also have to model and verify. Um, here's one of our you know, more realistic altitude plots uh, that you know, I think it predicts around 15,000 feet, uh, which you know, we ended up at 11,000 feet. Simulations are never perfect. And so um, you know, if we predict 15 and we get 11, that's not terrible. Uh, you know, we're still working on it. And then last one you see there is an engine characterization. So I'll talk more about the engine in a moment. Yeah, so Eureka 1 was powered by a 600 pound force uh, light bulb engine. And so this is all machine in-house, all a custom engine. Uh, you can see there uh, a CAD, an internal CAD of the engine. Uh, it's an ablative cooled engine with a pintel injector. Um, so you see the nozzle here, this is the ablative liner that just protects the engine from the heat of combustion. And then the injector, that complex piece of uh, hardware there, all machined in-house, all developed in-house. And um, you can see that's how we inject our fuel and our oxidizer into the engine and start that combustion. So you see in the middle here is one of our hot fires of the Eureka 1 engine light bulb. And then up at the right there, you can see the injector taken apart and sort of all of these components that we've manufactured ourselves. Okay, so once we've tested this engine, once we've built this engine, uh, we need some way to get to, to fuel it, to store the propellants and feed those propellants into the engine. So that's where the rest of the propulsion system comes in. Um, so you can see, before we start testing, before we start building, we need to CAD it, we need to model it, we need to, des to design. Um, and that you can see there, uh, this gives us a sense of the scale of this rocket. Overall, uh, Eureka 1 was 19 feet tall, uh, just for a sense of scale. Um, but once we've figured out what it's gonna look like, we build it. And that's an extensive process. You can see here, um, essentially we're assembling a bunch of tanks and some plumbing and fittings just to get our propellants into our engine through all this hardware here. And um, once we've assembled things, once we've tested things component by component, as well as on a system level, we go out and hot fire in the Mojave Desert, uh, which you can see there, that was our first successful vertical configured hot fire. <clears throat> so yeah, the uh, avionics is a very important part of our team. It's basically all of the hardware, software, um, radio, you know, systems that make uh, our system work. So when we're out in the desert testing our engines, uh, we need a way to collect telemetry on the pressures that are in the engine, temperatures. Um, we also need a way to control the system uh, remotely so we don't have to, you know, manually open and close valves while the engine is running and that kind of thing. Um, so we do everything from building our own PCBs to making, designing and building our own radio systems um, to writing all the software that makes it possible. So um, you can see here a few, few of the things we've built. Um, this is a custom radio uh, video transmitter, actually, that we used on Eureka 1 to get the live video um, from the rocket while it was flying. Um, this is the flight computer, which uh, was designed to collect uh, all the telemetry from the rocket and control um, you know, um, uh, parachute deployment. Uh, and then on the right, you can see uh, the av bay, which is where all of our avionics systems are, are mounted uh, structurally inside the vehicle. This picture was taken about like an hour before launch, so super epic. Oh, what? Um, yeah, so another big part of, um, you know, another huge part of the team is the uh, structure side of things um, in order to actually house all of those components, uh, you know, put them in a structure that's strong enough to sustain the forces of flight, um, light enough to actually get uh, off of the launch rail, um, and then also aerodynamic enough to achieve an uh, acceptable altitude. Um, so sort of in order to actually accomplish those tasks, um, this is kind of what the life cycle of a typical part might look like. We sort of start out um, by simulating the well. So first, we ask the sims team sort of to give an idea of you know the overall forces that will be experienced on a part. 
Um, we simulate it, we sort of whittle it down to, you know, an acceptable uh, level while still, um, you know, retaining its manufacturability. We integrate it in like a system CAD, um, and then we manufacture it and actually, you know, place it in the vehicle. This here is the thrust transfer system that uh, took, it mounted the engine um, and then had to sustain uh, and transfer all of the load from the thrust throughout the flight. Um, as for like how we actually go about manufacturing these things, um, so like, first of all, like at a high level, um, we sort of just like, when we're designing a vehicle, um, we kind of like diagram out where we want everything to be in relation uh, with other things. Um, that always ends up being kind of like a contest between all the sub teams, like avionics might want their out base somewhere, but you know, propulsion might want to put the tank there, like, you know, so that's, uh, you know, once we reach that, um, we sort of uh, delegate out to a bunch of people and they sort of design all of the structures that actually hold all of those things in place. Um, you can see kind of every sort of aspect of like uh, our manufacturing for Eureka 1 in this uh, slide. Um, you can see like the metal bulkheads on um, all the way on the left there um, that actually hold the fiberglass on and then mount them to the, the fiberglass tubes to the tank. Um, and then um, you can see for sort of any part um, that we couldn't readily make out of either fiberglass or uh, some combination of metal and sheet metal, uh, we actually utilize um, 3D printing, um, specifically in this case, multi bed fusion. Um, so, um, yeah. We also deal a lot with um, like stability and aerodynamics, or at least try to. Um, these are um, the fins that run your Eco One. Um, we were able to manufacture these um, all like on a water jet, um, and um, you know they they uh, they came together pretty nicely. Um, so another big part of um, like all like most of the day to day work we're actually doing though, um, you know we obviously we cut out the whole system, we design everything, but that you know only takes a certain amount of our time. Like most of what we're doing is like actual physical testing to verify all the systems. It's one thing to like you know put something on paper and have it work like in a spreadsheet, but um, having it actually, um, you know, do what you expect it to in real life is like a whole nother can of worms and it always takes like 10 times longer than you think it will. So um, I'll hand it off to Will to talk about how we do that for the prop system. Yeah, so first up is hardware testing. Uh, as Asa said, this is a very extensive process. Uh, once we assemble all these fittings, all these tanks, uh, they don't really work together as you expect. Um, integration is, Pretty big deal. So we start off propulsion testing with water flows. Uh, in these tests, we use water as an analog for propellants. Uh, this ensures that we can test our system at pressure and verify pressure performance, but also water is a safe analog for propellants. There's no risk of, risk of combustion. Uh, if it's leaking, it's just water. Uh, so that's where we start. And once we figured out how our system behaves with water, uh, we move to a more realistic analog for propellants, which is cryogenic liquid nitrogen. Uh, during these cryogenic flows, uh, we call them cold flows, uh, we test the cryo capability of our system at pressure. And you know, here's where things sort of start to go wrong a little more often. Um, and so this is a very extensive process of cold flow after cold flow after cold flow, just verifying the functionality of our system. Alongside this, we're also collecting massive amounts of data uh, through our various sensors on, on the system to verify safe pressures and uh, flow rates and whatnot, just to, just to know that the propulsion system is performing as we expect it to. Uh, and then last up, once we've completed enough cold flows to be confident in our system, we bring it up to the Mojave Desert and we hot fire it. And during these hot fire tests, we use you know, liquid propane and liquid oxygen, our actual propellants, bring them together for combustion and then also record massive amounts of data so that we can go back later and refine our systems, optimize our systems using this data, using various simulations that we've built. So yeah, like Will said, the testing process is uh, very uh, lengthy. And in fact, I would say that we spend maybe 80 to 90% of the time on our team testing rather than designing things, which is fantastic. And it's actually awesome for our students who get their hands on the hardware like all the time. Um, and um, so yeah, basically the hardware testing, the, well, the testing process for avionics, um, it starts with designing designing the hardware. So we have you know, a lot of students on our team who know how to design hardware now, um, you know, in particular printed circuit boards and radios and whatnot. 
Um, and then when, once those are designed, we have to build them up by hand. So we um, assemble all of our own PCBs by hand. Um, once they're assembled, we have to test them in a lab, you know, make sure that they're operating the way we expect. Um, but then the main, the big test that we do is actually putting them on the system and doing cold flows and water flows and making sure that they operate the way that we expect, because you can't just expect something that you test in a lab in, in you know, like a very like unit test kind of thing to work when it's actually on your real system. So, and that's like one thing that we do really well on our team is we always push ourselves to test the hardware that we're building in the situation it's going to be in for play, right? And that, that, that's what makes us so successful, I think. Um, so, yeah, um, we, I think uh, another valuable, I kind of already said this, but the value that our team gives our students um, is that they get their hands on hardware in ways that they would never experience in a classroom, right? Like you go learn about circuits in a classroom, but what does that mean in real life? Well, this is the team where you're going to learn about that. Um, so anyway, um, we also do, uh, like I said before, uh, yeah, like I said before, we kind of do our own custom radio development for our vehicles. Uh, and this is actually really cool. So um, we, uh, we uh, make our own antennas on the outside of our airframes using copper tape. Uh, and then we go and tune them and test them, uh, range test them across the bay. So we might have someone uh, like at uh, Lawrence Hall of Science uh, and someone else will go down to the marina or even uh, Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, and then we'll do range testing, see what kind of what uh, rate of telemetry we can transmit. And we'll even do that for the live video transmission as well. And because of all the testing we've done with our radio systems, we've now had very uh, good success with flying these on actual vehicles. So like for Eureka the one that launched in December, we had live video and live telemetry the entire flight, which is pretty incredible. Um, so yeah, here you can see a picture, uh, picture up here of one of our airframes with the copper antenna on it being tested across the bay. Um, we also have a picture here of someone uh, standing on top of a part of the Golden Gate Bridge uh, for, for range testing. Um, and then we also do simulations now, which is kind of a new thing for us in terms of radio telemetry. But we started to do some more advanced simulations of what uh, our antennas, how our antennas perform when they're on metal airframes or other kind of airframes that might not be so, um, uh, like might not play so well with that radio telemetry. <clears throat> Um, yeah, so a lot of our structures testing um, happens like literally out in the field um, for like uh, recovery testing. Um, so these are a couple snippets of um, testing our main parachute actuation system. Um, so the main parachute has a black powder uh, based system um, where, you know, we've got a um, certain amount of black powder at the bottom that uh, we blow up with like a E-match. Um, by the flight computer, that pressure I was kind of like a piston and that shoots the parachute out. Um, so, um, you know, we did a bunch of tests for that um, to, you know, sort of get an idea of internal pressures um, to adequately seal the piston um, and be familiar with it. Um, another sort of facet of um, the recovery system is the drogue chute. So we do um, a side deploy uh, mechanism for the drogue chute. Essentially, the sort of overall flight trajectory, um, you know, we go up at the peak of the trajectory when we're at the minimum speed, we deploy the drogue chute. And then the drogue chute, the idea is that it slows down the vehicle sufficiently to then deploy the larger main chute, which um, it, it takes the vehicle down uh, at a slower descent rate. Um, you can see a video of us testing the side deploy. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't really realize like how many times I said nice until I put that together. Like, actually, like the first time I played that was in front of a live audience. That was, that was a total surprise. So, um, anyway, uh, yeah, we did that pretty extensively. Um, another huge fact, so like, like Andy was talking about how we like to test our avionics and everything in flight. Um, another big part of like, you know, all the, a lot of the sort of, um, you know, buttons you saw in the timeline earlier were um, lab launches, uh, low altitude demonstrator. So these are sort of like around eight feet tall, smaller, about like, you know, half the size kind of of our larger liquid vehicles. Um, and what they do is, you know, they, they basically hoist the out bay 
up to, um, you know, around 10,000 feet around Mach 1, um, like similar to E1 speeds and altitudes. Um, and basically, every time we launch one of these, we learn like a, a, either a new way to fail or, um, you know, a bunch of sort of just unexpected things. Like even just the act of like taking the flight computer out to the desert and like putting it on a launch rail, you know, invariably it tells us something new that we did not consider. Um, the like rapid sort of uh, turnaround of these vehicles um, can pretty largely be like attributed to the fact that we actually 3D printed the entire airframes, um, which is pretty uncommon to do for high powered rockets. Um, we were able to work with HP Labs to do that. Um, so we used like PA-12 uh, for the airframe. We obviously took like a mass hit relative to using something like carbon fiber, but given our goals were just to launch a lot and you know, be out of the desert. Um, the manufacturing method aligned itself like very well with our ultimate goal set. Um, so yeah, we, we did a ton of these uh, last semester. Um, so, oops, here we go, it's unreliable. Um, anyway, that eventually took us to the flight of Eureka 1. Um, so I've got a sort of live video here, hopefully it plays. It, here it is, it's loading. All right, it's, uh, it's loading, but there yeah, go. there we go. Um, yeah, so this is like the uh, inflation. So yeah, um, you can tell, so, you know, it, it, it was perfect. Um, basically what went wrong, um, so essentially the more sort of keen observers might have noticed uh, the, the drogue coming out while the engine was still on. Um, there are a lot of things that sort of led that to happening. So um, basically in our burn, uh, it seems like we experienced like uh, higher than expected OF ratios. So oxidizer to fuel. Um, the more oxidizer relative to fuel you have, the hotter the engine gets. Um, we actually have seen this before in a hot fire burn where we have a higher than expected OF ratio and then the graphite nozzle actually shatters. Um, in our hot fires prior to launch, uh, we thought we had that fully ironed out, but uh, seemingly um, not. Um, so what happens is that um, as the nozzle shattered, it created a lot of thrust asymmetry. Um, basically, you have all the gas expanding from one side, and so the vehicle sort of instantly goes at a very high angle of attack. Um, and now you can imagine what that did to the barometer, which is like the main thing that's uh, sensing our altitude uh, over time. Um, basically, we for the barometer, which is in the flight computer, we have like um, basically vent ports. Um, as it went super high off angle of attack, there's like a ton of air going into the vent ports. Um, and then it's like tapering off and just creating a lot of noise. Basically, the flight computer then sees that and thinks, oh, time to deploy. Um, and so the parachute deploys, uh, you know, like a fraction of a second after the nozzle breaks. Um, so, you know, it, it thought it was doing the right thing, but uh, it was wrong. Um, basically, yeah, you can see in the GIF on the screen, you can see what that looked like from the ground. Um, it's kind of going all um, So, um, yeah, eventually, you know, what uh, goes up has to come down. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, it looks like uh, I mean, it's crazy because, like, super thick fiberglass just completely crumpled. Like, all the all the super thick aluminum tanks looked like soda cans. Um, it was it was crazy. Um, it, it went, like, uh, so because it sort of did, like, that dog-like maneuver when the uh, nozzle broke, it, it ended up flying, like, pretty far uh, horizontally. Um, it went around three miles away, uh, like, over a highway. And it, it hit mountains, so it's like, uh, it, and I, I say highway, it was more like a road, but like, no, no, like, 
we didn't almost hit the interstate, but um, <laughs> you know, that, but um, anyway, you know that. So you know, we we learned a lot. Um, uh, Lily, I can pass it off to you to talk about yeah what we're learning what's next. So although we failed to recover E1, we still consider it to be a success. The goal of E1 was for us to gain experience with liquid rocketry and to launch our first liquid rocket, and we did. Given it was not perfect, but we still have a lot to learn. In the past few semesters and years, we gained like a crazy amount of momentum for innovation. That's something we're going to keep pushing in the future. So uh, this year and this semester, we'll be working on three main projects. The first one is a new generation of solid demonstrators. So very similar to the plan, again, the goal is to demonstrate the reliability of our avionics to recovery system to address some of the issues we saw with Eureka 1. Second project is development and launch of Eureka 2. Eureka 2 is going to be very similar to Eureka 1, but better. For example, we're going to be incorporating our electronic, our in-house electronic pressure regulation system with the hopes of claiming the collision altitude record currently held by UCLA at 22,000 feet. So, go Bears. Yeah, <laughs> yeah definitely. <laughs> I mean, we're already losing against UCLA football. We can't right. do engineering, right? <laughs> right. We're going to get something. So the plan for you to do is this spring, very far out testing campaign, so that as soon as we come back in the fall, launch, go and claim that record. The last project is going to be the development of Eureka 3. Eureka 3 is our spaceship rocket, and really the reason why SEB exists as a club. So this year, we're going to be working mainly on the engine and some avionics development. So as you can see, SEB has a lot to look forward to, and you will definitely be hearing a lot of us us very soon. Thank you to all of us for listening. Always a pleasure to talk about what we do, and thank you to SSL for hosting. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. We're always happy to answer those. We also have a bunch of props, including the engine that flew on Eureka 1. So feel free to ask. Come check it out. All right. I got a page of questions, but I'm going to let everybody else talk. <laughs> We're also taking questions on Zoom. Uh, Claire can monitor all of them. Yeah, so, so. yeah, so I have a question. Hi, my name is Phyllis Whittlesey. I'm a research scientist here. I've been here for like seven years, but I'm like a lab scientist. So I do science with like multimeters and trenches on a good day. Um, so my question for you guys is, first of all, just like awesome, very impressed. I think you guys have done more work in this project than maybe I have in my last seven years. Um, but my question is more like, as students, how much of... Um, what you needed to do to get this done? Did you learn in class versus self-teach? And if you had to self-teach, what sources did you find useful? I don't know, maybe you guys like have different answers based on which sub teams you have. Yeah, so uh, very little um, what I do, had, I learned in class. Almost all of it was, I, I do propulsion uh, pretty extensively. And so you don't assemble fittings in class. You don't uh, necessarily need to worry about plumbing in class. And so it's a high pressure plumbing system, high uh, propellant systems, combustion, that sort of thing is maybe covered in theory in class, like fluid flow uh, combustion, but never in practice. And so this is my only sort of area of like practically applying this uh, knowledge, not even that I've learned in class, this is all pretty much novel stuff that I've learned through the club. Uh, same, same for avionics. Um, like, you know, in class, you might learn how to design an analog circuit to read a sensor in theory. But what does that actually look like in practice? I mean, you know, you'll never learn that in a lecture. And it's the same for PCB design. Like, you're not going to learn that in a class, right? You've got to go and, like, teach yourself. Um, I would say, like, resources-wise, um, uh, we've kind of developed some of our own in-house resources. Um, like when I came into the team, we hadn't really ever made any PCBs or any kind of, you know, advanced avionics. So, um, like I came in with the knowledge of how to use the uh, Altium designers, what we use for designing our PCBs. But then we kind of made some in-house videos about how to design using that software. Um, we also train our new members. So, like I'll go and train people on how to design uh, PCBs just from my own knowledge. And then um, the other thing is that our team doesn't have intro projects for new members, which is kind of unique because a lot of clubs do. Um, like we, we very much believe in the philosophy of just throwing people um, into the mix and just uh, they'll learn by experience. Um, which has worked very well for us and works very well for all of our members who are sitting along the wall over there. Um, but um, it, it, again, it's not for everyone, but because we do things that way, people, um, it's a steep learning curve, but people learn very quickly. 
Um, like another part of that is like we don't have like an application process, right? We let like you know anyone join at pretty much any time, and uh, you know they can either do it or not. And you know the, the people that end up doing it uh, end up being you know pretty good at it. Yeah, um, it's like self selecting And another thing about resources is like at least on the propulsion side, there's also like a pretty huge breadth of just like textbooks that were written in like the '60s and '70s about like um you know rocket propulsion schemes and whatnot um you know there there is like a like a good deal of literature um you also learn a ton from like every time you fail uh right you know you just get to scratch off another thing not to do that's true i would say like our team has so much experience just from failing like which is like fantastic like there's so much knowledge that we now have in the team that you honestly probably couldn't even find anywhere like you probably couldn't find it condensed into a textbook so it's pretty incredible. Um, the, the key though is like like to fail forward. So like yeah. we, like I think a big big part of it is like failure analysis and like also just like writing stuff down because there's like really no um, yeah we have like very detailed yeah. documentation about all of our failures and also like everything we do as a club we document yeah because um, there's no so benefit in like failing if like the person who knows why it fails graduated and can tell anyone <laughs> um, yeah. I also add that um, as a college team moving forward with like E3 development, um, the like amateur um, and like collegiate rocketry community is pretty open and people generally communicate when we go to um, our test site in Mojave Desert, there's often other college teams there. Um, there's also lots of YouTube videos of like how other teams build their test stands and their engines and conduct their testing. And we do a lot of like looking at how another team has maybe done something similar or maybe they wrote a paper about it or like how their engine failed this one time, maybe we can avoid that or we can learn from it. And, you know, sometimes we reach out to them and ask for their data or just like communicate with them. So that's another thing as well. So you say you're going to beat UCLA with your next launch. You've got to get to 22,000 feet. So can this vehicle get to 22,000 feet or do you have to make mods or what's, what's, how do you know? Yeah, well, so um, first, like I would say like, you know, or, or in our Sims, um, like A, they've like gotten a lot of sort of better now, like a lot of the, a lot of the variability in the Sim um, previously was kind of in our like mechanical dome regulators. I mean, those are like notoriously kind of difficult to pressure. Right? pressure. Um, yeah, that's right. Um, so now we're using like electronic uh, regulators, you know, from our tanks in, into our pressure system. We have a lot more control and a much better sort of idea of like um, what the actual thrust profile will be. The other thing is that like this vehicle would have gone higher if the drogue chute hadn't deployed yeah, early. Sure. I mean, your goal was 15. And yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So and the other thing is that we are making our um, lot like a liquid oxygen tank bigger. So we're expanding a volume, basically. So um, is it a secret? What do you think you can get to the next rocket? Twenty-five. Okay. It's, it's cool. like um, it, it kind of like is one of those things that like sort of varies day by day because someone will do another sim and be like, oh, we didn't come for this, so we didn't do that. Well, mm -hmm. so it's like you sort of have to aggregate sort of like the average of what people and uh, like it's not it's not perfect. Uh, it, but we're making like like basically based on what E one would have done. Uh, had it not failed, right? It would have done like, you know, pretty much like pretty close to like, you know, 15, maybe even like a little bit higher, like, cause we, we have pretty solid burn. In fact, like a bit higher for us than expected, um, except for, you know, our, our, our nozzle breaking, right? That really threw a monkey wrench into things. But um, we're basically, you know, sticking with like a, a similar system, but then we're adding so many upgrades, like the structure um, is kind of being like massively overhauled. Um, Previously, we used a seven and a half inch uh, diameter uh, airframe. Um, we've now made the system more compact, and we're now fitting it into a seven inch airframe. So that has massive aerodynamic benefits. Um, also, you know, we're just doing a lot of sort of things uh, around the system um, that you know decrease weight in like a pretty significant way. So it's it's basically you know um, better in like so many areas, and uh, you know all of our sort of sims when we put that all together seem to point to you know, somewhere around twenty five thousand feet. Yeah, and all our sims have been sort of informed by Eureka 1. And so we can use a lot of the data we collected from Eureka 1 and apply it directly to Eureka 2. Yeah. So it's in the same family, it's just, but it's trimmed down, pared down. Yeah, it's, it's, exactly. Okay. Yes, yeah, so the three main changes are going to be the electronic regulation and pressure system, which is going to be really push our engine to its limit of what it can do in terms of thrust. So that's the first main change. The second main change is, as Andy mentioned, the tanks. And then just in terms of structures, we're going to try to make everything maybe a little smaller, just to make the heavy, the rocket more lightweight. So all of that should be a little higher. 
Excuse me. Is, is all this work done on campus, the hardware and the PC board and everything? So the PCBs, like all the avionics kind of technical work in a lab, we do out on campus. Um, and uh, other work that's like propulsion and everything else basically um, happens at RFS, Richmond Field Station, which is a small plot of land that's owned by the university that's out in Richmond, about 20 minute drive from campus. So we have a workspace out there where we can do all this testing, do like build the build the structures, build the propulsion system. Um, but anything like a small, you know, avionics, like a, you know, um, technical work happens on campus, and also all of our machining happens on campus. So for machining our engine or machining uh, structures, piece components, we'll set we'll machine on campus and then assemble it at us. And then just to be clear, everything that requires a pyrotechnics license, we then go out to the Mojave Desert to do where there's a bunch of people who have pyrotechnics licenses. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, we don't do hot fires at our house. <laughs> <laughs> How are you funded? This is not cheap. It's like barely, we're barely funded. It's like it's like it's rounding, and that's like why I think it's like partially so successful because wait, like, that, yeah, that hundred percent true. Yeah, our team has gotten so good at like figuring out how to make things unconventional ways. Like, um, I mean, okay, as an example, the propellant tanks we use on our on our rocket, you'd think you need to like spend time, you know, manufacturing your own propellant tanks, and they're expensive and heavy or whatever. But we actually use um, air suspension tanks for trucks. So you can buy these tanks. They're super cheap because they're mass manufactured for the consumer market, 200 bucks, but they work perfectly for our application. Um, so that's just an example. But there's so many times when you buy like Home Depot valves that you use in your house for water, they work perfectly with liquid nitrogen. So like things like that, our team's gotten really good at. But um, in terms of actual funding, we do get some money from the university, from the Canada Engineering Department. Um, there's also just a lot of students who are willing to front a lot of cash, which they're very lucky. It's like a crazy story about that. Like one of the like founders of the club, like uh, sort of in the early days when they're still trying to like actually develop a lot of like the early early hardware. Um, like you know they they're running into a lot of financial issues, so he kept like saying like, oh, we got a one thousand dollar grant, two thousand dollar grant. Turns out we learned later after he graduated that he was like working at a planetarium and like putting his entire paycheck into like what bankrolling the club. Well, wow. wow. like um, people like on our team have that dedication. Like everyone who's yeah. here, we, like everyone in this room, like literally everyone against the wall over there has that same dedication. Yeah. yeah. Um, and also like the, the more things that we build in house, um, the better we are at fixing them when they inevitably break. Because like, right, if we get, you know, most of the system donated to us. Um, that doesn't really help us much in the way of, you know, fixing it when it inevitably breaks. Um, so, you know, honestly, it, it kind of makes us go faster in a way. Just go Do you ahead. have time to go to classes? <laughs> I mean, we wish early, but yeah. Yeah. Have, uh, have someone tell me the story about the coffin in the hallway, because that, that like, next year's, like, figuring out how to scrap things together when you don't have budget or schedule, that's something that I think has made its way all the way up to major NASA SMB missions. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, never lose your instinct for scrapping this topic. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, Joel Pugat, the engineer of the lab, I'm a suspension here. Uh, as you say, learning from failure is a bit of an art. What, um, Usually, uh, teams end up flying something where they couldn't quite instrument it as well as they wanted to. What what things did you not get that you wish you could have gotten from the budget play? Definitely, like um, better sort of like one of the major sort of things in the way of like sensors that we're implementing on our next launches is like although we had a GPS in Eureka One, um, using GPS and other sort of non-barometric methods to sort of derive like um, velocity and altitude. Um, because right, like a major, for deployment. yeah, a major reason why we like you know failed on deployment is because we were using like one uh, semi unreliable uh, system to you know um, basically deploy our parachute right. So like sensor fusion is kind of like a big thing that um, we're going to be doing on the next version. Uh, In addition, just knowing more about like charge deployment, like uh, something we do with people like rape wires on say our igniter and like. Uh, some data that we could have gotten but didn't from the last flight was like a break more data on when charges deployed for the main or drone yeah. parachutes because trying to like figure out what happens you know from a bunch of wreckage where like your entire recovery system is in tiny little pieces is really difficult yeah it feels like, like an ntsb investigation where everyone's <laughs> trying to but then you know it's not as controlled so it's a pain um it's like really just having like a binary 
you know, uh, like laws, like, like what happened when um, is something that like we have implemented in some places, uh, sketchily implemented in others and just completely missing from, you know, some. So it's like that's a sort of something that we're adding in every sort of area. <laughs> I mean, and the other thing is that I'll just quickly add, um, one of the cool things about our team is like we said before, but we build a lot of stuff in house that you might invent like buy like, otherwise. Um, as an example, like how do you determine the fill level of a propellant tank? It's actually a hard problem, right? Because you can't look at it. You can't like you can try to measure the temperature at different points along the tank to see like where is their liquid nitrogen or liquid oxygen and where is the gas, which is kind of tricky and doesn't give you much resolution. One way that we've figured out how to do it very well is actually capacitive fill sensing. So we have a, basically a long tube, like two concentric tubes inside our propellant tanks. And as the propellant fills the tubes, um, the capacitance changes. So we built our own custom sensor um, just out of plumbing fittings, basically, and, and a PCB um, that can read the capacitance of this tube and tell us very accurately the fill level of the tank. So this is like a sensor you might buy commercially for like $500 to $1,000. But we build it for under 100 bucks. And this is extremely valuable data. Uh, knowing the fill level of our tanks uh, gives us an indication of flow rates into our engine, which further helps us optimize the engine and really eat up that last bit of performance. We know exactly how much fuel and how much oxygen there are entering that engine. And then just to like expand on kind of like the earlier question is like 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 something another major area in which this sort of differs from like classes is like in classes you're given all of the sort of starting values you need to derive an answer. Um, but in this, it's like, you know, you, you have just no idea how to actually get any of those starting values. So it's like you have sort of like another set of problems just based on actually getting to that point where you can actually derive an answer. And that's honestly more challenging than actually, you know, deriving the actual answer. So that, that's probably like most of the where the creativity comes in. Yeah. So I kind of piggybacks on the question I was going to ask you guys about um, your radio. Like, I was curious to see what your, because, you know, radio designs, like antennas, and there's some cool looking plots there, and I don't design radios, but you guys do. So was that a reason you guys wanted to do this because of, of cost, or was there some added extra benefit that you guys decided to do it that way? Um, yeah, so the reason we went for radio design like this in the first place is actually because one of our old rockets had a carbon fiber airframe. And so some of you might know that um, carbon fiber is not very friendly to RF. So RF cannot penetrate carbon fiber. It's actually right there. You can come check it out after the talk. But um, so one of the solutions that we came up with was to put the antenna on the outside of the airframe, because then there is no airframe to block your RF. Um, but the problem is the airframe is curved. So, um, and, and so fortunately at the time we were designing this antenna, we had one of our members taking a, a ham radio class uh, it's actually a seminar um, hosted by a chemistry professor, which is pretty cool. Um, and so he he had just learned about how to make his own antennas and, and tune them using a very cheap little device called a VNA, which you can buy on Amazon. You can get expensive ones, but he bought a cheap one. Um, and so we we just made an antenna on a whim on one of our airframe sections and just went and this is actually one of the first tests we ever did with the custom antennas, this picture right here. Um, we just went and range tested it and it worked very well. And this is, we didn't even do any simulations. Like we just tape piece of tape on a uh, copper, uh, copper tape on an airframe and tested it. Um, but you know, this has evolved over time. We've done this for a bunch of our vehicles now. Um, and so recently we uh, got access to ANSYS, which lets you do um, antenna simulations along with other stuff. Um, and so we've been playing around with how do we optimize the antenna now that we can actually simulate it in software. Um, and so um, we have some people on our team who are very interested in radio and have ham licenses and whatnot. Um, and so this is just a, one of the recent simulations we've done. Um, the other thing is that since we're considering switching to metal airframes rather than carbon fiber or fiberglass, um, how do we make an antenna that works well with a metal airframe, right? Because that's also very difficult when you're dealing with RF. So. And like that's like turning into some like pretty funky potential designs. Like one thing you know that we can do with like a metal airframe that we can't do with like any other type is like to make like a slot antenna, for instance, where you know you're actually using the resonance of the sheet metal itself to you know as an antenna. Like we probably won't do that because it's like complicated. But you know there, there's like that's actually what this yeah it's about. It. It's what the the NASA sounding rockets do. They have they have patch antennas yeah. that are that are printed, you know, essentially printed circuits that wrap around. They're working up in, at two gigahertz. You guys are probably, what, 100 megahertz? About um, 400. We, we've been in the two meter band, um, okay. as well as the 70 centimeters, so 400 megahertz, and also 900 megahertz. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, did you need to coordinate with any federal agency regarding the safety? <laughs> and second, uh, also the interference of your antenna. I don't know. And second, do you think that in a few years it will be considered one of the UFO? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> luckily, where we launched safety officer, we, we are sort of we launched in sort of one of the most like legally ambiguous places ever. <laughs> not, not like legally ambiguous necessarily, but you, like, I it, 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 it is fully legal. legal. It's like, but it's like legally unique um, because um, it's called Friends of Amateur Rocketry. Essentially, they've owned this like massive patch of land out in the middle of like literally nowhere um, forever, pretty much. Um, and the airspace is protected by Edwards Air Force. Yes. Yeah. So on the weekends, we can launch rockets up to fifty thousand feet without any license. Without talking to the FAA, if you uh, if you go over fifty thousand feet, like you have to file a launch waiver with the FAA. They already have like forms for that and whatnot. They make it like fairly easy. Actually, people do it all the time out of there. But it's nice because again, it's. It is, it's a very unique place because no flights overhead. And it's in the like, middle of nowhere. Basically, the only place yeah. you can do this in the United States. So you can go from like MIT, go from like, yeah. MIT yeah. like Michigan, Purdue. Like they'll drive across the country just to yeah. use this launch site. So we are extremely lucky to be located where we are. Yeah, even though it's like an eight hour drive with all of our stuff back in the U Haul, it still like pales in comparison to <laughs> the, you know, just stuff that all the East Coast teams have to go through to get there. It's, yeah, we are not jealous. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, your rocket engine it doesn't look like in the pictures like it's gimbal. So uh, you're just relying on everything being lined up such that it goes up and doesn't go around in a circle. Right. So uh, we don't actively control our rockets. The engine is just mounted securely so the thrust goes down. Uh, if we were to gimbal or thrust vector our engine, I think we're actually approaching uh, some restricted stuff. So ITAR technologies that might yeah. be uh, federally or legally do restricted. Yes. Yeah, yes. We, do, we, so we, we have fins for this. Yeah, part. so like really it's like what a lot of the sims sort of are stability wise is kind of like in verifying that we have like a dynamically stable system. So like right the you know center dynamic pressure is behind the center of mass. We actually kind of almost messed that up in a really severe way on the last launch <laughs> because you see the little like tapered bit on the end. Um, the sims that we used to do the fins actually didn't account for that. And it turns out that flow likes to stick to that bit and uh, it ends up actually being a lot less turbulent than um, you know we assumed in our fin stability uh, uh, simulation. So uh, you know it's it's like always a sort of moving goalpost of how accurate the sims are, but, uh, you know, that's another thing we're doing. Another yeah. example so, of something that you can't just go read a textbook about, but you have to learn by doing. Yeah. Um, yeah, the other thing is that we are actually working on TVC, thrust vector control, for our engine. Um, we're hoping to hot fire it in uh, first weekend of May, or sorry, not May, uh, March. Yeah. So very coming up very soon, but we are actually working on that. We've actually had a rocket, though, like completely just be obliterated because, uh, like, Lab 7, because we did the, the stability wrong and it was too windy. Um, basically, it, you know, went and it did a Yeah. Not, so that, that happens. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So is there a lot riding on a single launch then? As you, as you said, that one went up and down again. Well, so the idea with like the lab rockets is that um, because we like basically, okay, the entire airframe, um, we, we basically 3D printed at uh, zero cost. Um, it, it's more like like with uh, HP Labs, um, and it's it's nice because like basically this entire airframe you can cram into about two prints. Um, and actually build up and around like you know 24 hours so out for the actual like structure um you know it kind of like led to very easy very uh low risk sort of turnarounds for the actual structural aspects i would say like for each of these launches that didn't go well like the main um sort of hit was to the avionics system and see the clock yeah yeah like we fly the avionics on these rockets um to you know test if they will actually cause the vehicle to recover properly like detect apogee and deploy the parachutes um, and each time we crash that, it's very unfortunate um, because then we have to build a whole new flight computer and whatnot. Um, but we've gone to a very good state with these vehicles where we can make super cheap avvays and just throw them in there and it's fine. Um, and then I guess I would say the other main cost is the motor. Um, the motor is like 
what, 800 well, rockets? Yeah, so with these, that's like a big difference with um, these specific rockets because, um, right, like I said, they're around like half the size of E1 vehicles, around eight feet tall. Um, they actually use uh, solid motors so that we don't have to focus at all on the plumbing propulsion system. It's just like, yeah, we hit a button and it launches. Um, the procedural sort of, um, you know, like the, the amount of humans you actually need to be doing things to launch a liquid bipropellant rocket is, uh, you know, you need, you need a lot of sense. You need a lot of people turning valves and, you know, with wrenches out on the pad. Um, with these, uh, you know, we've, we've been able to launch these before with just like, you know, four people and, you know, you just press a button. And so that, that's another big part of these um, is that, you know, they're, they're pretty uh, plug and play. So you, you, instead of fabricating your own solid motors or casting them, you guys procure that because yeah, you want to work on something else. Exactly. These are like, um, these are commercial off the shelf. Um, we buy them from like Aerotech uh, commercial space. So they make uh, sort of like modular grains and then they also manufacture uh, tubes. It's like a ammonium perchlorate uh, composite component. Um, so, uh, yeah. Yeah, and if we're not wanting to do it ourselves, we're, we try to focus our propulsion efforts on liquid systems, just because when we ultimately reach space, uh, that's what we're going to be using because of liquid right. system. Yeah. Sorry, which my question is. Sorry about um, attitude control. That's a whole other subsystem that I don't think that you really develop. So, what was that? Who's your system engineer who was managing that innovation in the new system? Uh, the TVC, you mean? Or yeah, yeah. We'll right see. there. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So, the goal of TVC isn't really to buy it just because it gets really close to IFR territory. And we're not really sure what the legality of that is, especially since technically, like, if you read the IFR laws carefully, nothing's allowed. Um, like the way they're written, it's kind of ambiguous. So we're not we're not uh, willing to risk buying this system, especially since we don't have the resources and the knowledge. I think to adequately simulate and model these like these active control systems yeah. through this rocket um, throughout the various stages of flight, uh, I think it would really increase our cost and development uh, time. Um, so the goal of the TBC project is to just give the experience, um, kind of on the control side in general, with actuators uh, moving the engine, things like that. Um, even if it doesn't apply to a valuable learning experience. And uh, we're essentially entering into a competition where we would get money for a TPC test. Um, so we're hoping to hop out of that, get $15,000 towards a competition um, that's aiming to build like the self propelled lander. Uh, so as part of that competition, one thing we're working on is throttling our engine and the TPC part. So as Lily said, uh, we're developing that electronic regulation system and that brings all these new capabilities to a rocket. Um, so now we have the capability to throttle our engine so that's probably the most we'll do on the side of active controls, where we may throttle our engine for slight altitude increases of flight. But yeah, nothing on the terms of attitude control, roll control, uh, for, all of that stuff. For these rockets, scary. we'll just stick to fins. Right? Mm -hmm. Easy, uh, easy way to keep the rocket stable, and also spinning. So if you spin the rocket, it'll be spin stabilized. That's probably what we'll do. Yeah, and again, just to sort of contextualize the development of this sort of like controls architecture on the team, um, sort of it, all in parallel with all these sort of flights and hot fires. Um, you know, there was in the background um, sort of a long development program of our electronic uh, pressure regulation system. So those are all, you know, those all function with like, um, you know, they use like PID loops um, to actually, you know, control the, like a valve from, you know, from the nitrogen. Tank. So like we've developed a lot of the in-house controlled experience um, that we're now able to sort of utilize these other areas. Yeah. And to address the engineer question, that's the job of Will, our chief engineer. So he's kind of the glue between all our five technical leads. So the avionics propulsion structures, Manufacturing, what's the last yeah. thing? Yeah. So that are five, five main technical leads. And then we also have project managers that sometimes help out, like for the technical stuff. So we have Claire, who's in charge of the avionics hardware. We have Alex, who's in charge of recovery. And then we have Vint, who is in here, who would help with the control side of things. So this like structure is really cool to have like a good idea of everything that's going on in this. Yeah. Wait, the other fantastic thing, I'll just say real quick. Um, is that like everyone on our team knows what's going on on the other sub teams. So it's not like if you're on the avionics team, you only know about the avionics system. You don't know anything about the plumbing system. Like I'd say everyone here could explain how any particular part of the rocket works to, you know, pretty good detail. 
So I think that's what makes our team so successful as well, is that it's not like we're siloed into our own sub teams. Like everyone knows what's going on in all the other sub teams. So it's a very fantastic way to maintain you know, communication in our team. How have you guys been able to do that? Is it because of the size of your team? Or are you guys just really good at communicating with each other? Or I I would say it's probably the size of our team and also because everyone's like uh, goes to class a questionable amount of time. <laughs> it's also though like um it, it, like a big part is like we we sort of don't like like we sort of have developed this structure by having a lack of structure yeah um like every, everyone kind of you know just ends up talking to each other about their you know various <laughs> projects because um you know we we don't have like like we have a big general meeting where all the engineering teams present on what they've been doing and everybody on every which team is like you know giving feedback, you know, whether they know what they're talking about or not, or every other <laughs> part of the, yeah, yeah. you know, and like, you know, it's, it's like sort of, uh, you know, the, the less kind of hierarchical it is, the more sort of that just ends up happening naturally. Yeah. And this develops naturally for sure. Cause when people join the team, they don't necessarily know what they want to do, but, or if they do know what they want to do, they might want to do multiple things. And so like, we don't silo people into some, some people, like you're not just doing propulsion. Um, you know, you might do, a lot of propulsion and fitting stuff, but then you need to think about structures and you need to think about integrating that yeah. uh, propulsion work. So yeah, it's just better to let people work on what they are interested in and then just more get work gets done that way. So naturally people develop a sense to the whole system. And that's actually it, like another thing we're doing differently for E2 is like um, in e, for E1, like the, the uh, sort of plumbing system was kind of built to be part of the structure system because for some reason, before our time, we bought a bunch of these tubes that like nobody knows where they came from or, you know, that's an exaggeration. But um, anyway, the, the the plumbing, you know, and the structures didn't really talk very much. So we're actually now doing like structures and propulsion meetings sort of as one broader hardware meeting now. Um, so, and, you know, developing those two systems very much in parallel because uh, they're so cross contingent in so many ways. But you do have a system engineer. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. sorry, we're all, <laughs> we're all system engineers. All, yeah. In terms of integrations, uh, that is sort of managing uh, what work is getting done where and where that fits in a timeline overall. Like, right. Everyone kind of knows, uh, say, some team leads do know how their system should interact with other systems well enough that I think um, we don't worry too much about. Um, system level architecture integration. Well, so like what I was saying earlier, like when we're all sort of like laying out the overall concept of the rocket, like the debate that happens between all the sub teams is the systems engineer. It's like, you know, like everyone's sort of arguing and the eventual sort of um, block diagram that comes out of that, you know, does the job of the, the systems engineer and then sort of what maintains that structure is every sub team sort of fighting to maintain the structure of that block diagram. Um, so, you know, through, through like enough repetitive arguments, um, you eventually, you know, we've reached that, that final state. Um, you know, a question. About yeah, I was just curious, as for I was curious how uh, SEV is comprised, I guess, mainly Mechies, Eeks, maybe a couple business majors. So much Eeks. <laughs> a lot, so actually a surprising amount of Eeks. But not all the Eeks people do avionics. Like a lot of these people do plumbing stuff, like Sky Eeks, sort of. Um, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, maybe Mickey and Eeks, and then a little, like, mostly, like, STEM stuff. We do have some astrophysics, there, <laughs> and math, physics. We have a few humanities and social sciences, but obviously it's harder to attract people from those fields. Yeah. That being said, again, there's, like, no bar. Um, as in, it's something you're interested in, you want to hop in, like, no matter what major you are, you can pull up, and, like, the idea is you sort of jump in and learn everything you need to know by working with your hands, right? Like working on the system. And it's also cool too, because a lot of people come in from like, you know, very different backgrounds, both with like the kind of projects they worked on in the past or what they already know. And they bring it often to like uh, create things in unconventional ways or try doing things in new ways. Like uh, we have some people who come in who are like interested in, you know, who did like robotics in high school or something like that. And are have some interest in controls. And for example, it's like, now we're doing, you know, like a lot of controls things for like pressure regulation and throttling and TVC, right? So it's like just, you know, bringing in like people's knowledge coming from a lot of different places. A lot more for you. Um, how have you dealt rigorously or not rigorously with validating your simulation? Yeah, so with simulations, though, we start with the simulations and develop models based on sort of physical equations. Uh, but yeah, 
physics doesn't always model reality very well. And so um, we collect a whole lot of data. And so we can refine, sort of start with physics-based models and then go in more empirical data fits for a lot of the, say, pressure systems in our, in our system. Yeah, like the, like the whole reason we do hot fires so often, like we did, we've done 14 hot fires in the engine that we flew. The whole point of those hot fires was to validate our simulation and also to refine them. So if we do a simulation and then the, the thrust data is too low or too high, then we'd be like, okay, well, the, clearly the sim is wrong. So how can we improve the sim to make it better? And sometimes we're like, well, it's like so complicated. Why not just use empirical data that we have, right? right. So and then, some, some things we just collect a bunch of empirical data and then just do like a best fit and yeah. it works. And just like to clarify on that, like, like most of the time the problem is that like we're dealing with like very imperfect data. So it's like, like that's like for us, like a lot like empirical data ends up matching reality much more because, you know, we're always sort of developing our ability to actually collect accurate data. So it's kind of like, you know, you have to kind of find a- Yeah, like as an example, the pressure transducers we use on our vehicle are $14 from Amazon. So like, you know, obviously if you buy a more expensive one for $100, maybe it'll give you slightly better data, but we can get by with that lower quality data just because we can do empirical fitting of data when necessary, right? And we just don't need that higher quality of data. Like $100 is not going to, like the amount of improvement we get from that $100 PT is not worth the cost. So, yeah. Um, what are the clubs, um, what are the goals for the next year for the club? What are your main priorities? So launching the new solid demonstrator. So it's called Vlad this time for very low altitude demonstrator. So the idea with Vlad is that it's going to have the exact same recovery structure than E2. So again, like we understand that recovery is something we really need to focus on. So that's what we're going to be mainly working on this semester. So Vlad, if it works out, will demonstrate that the recovery is good to go for year two. So year two is also going to be happening pretty intensely. So we have a first hot fire coming up in March, which is going to be in cart format. So for hot fires, we actually do two types of setup in the cart and vertical. As you can imagine, like having to adjust fittings that are like 18 feet high kind of sucks. So being able to have like a cart where you're able to make quick adjustments makes it way easier on us and really makes our testing iteration way faster. Think shopping cart with liquid oxygen in it. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> so cart hot fire in March. If cart hot fire is successful, then we're going to start going in vertical form. So then something like this. And again, hot fire in April sometime. And if successful, get the Eureka 2 flight ready to start integrating all the structures. So as soon as you come back in the fall, launch Eureka 2. And then in parallel, Eureka 3. So mainly focusing on the engine. It's going to be much bigger because we see now we're going from like 25,000 feet to space. So it's going to be a lot bigger, a lot of custom to come and just like research on what type of engine. Like for example, we're not set on the blade, we might do region engine instead. So a lot to think about, and that's what we're going to be working on. And just like to say more about like where we're at now, like over the past few weeks, we've like designed most of like the structures and like propulsion system for E2, at least like we have a, you know, like pretty like high level view and like, you know, throughout the past like a uh, week or two, um, we've kind of been narrowing down the specifics. Um, and like, we're pretty much there, uh, you know, at least for our first iteration, we'll see actually what it looks like when we put everything together. But, um, you know, so now, right, like right now, we're, we're now manufacturing stuff um, and we're going to start putting it together pretty soon. What range do you intend to launch on for your y -Prom? Friend Venture Rocket Tree. It's out in uh, Mojave um, by, uh, yeah, like right by Mojave. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful place. Yeah. Do they have range safety requirements? Yeah, yeah. so many. Yeah, so they have like like a lot of the relief valves and systems we use and um you know just like shut offs and everything all come from they have like a basically it's run by a lot of people who have um like pretty like decades of experience basically in their yeah like there's a bunch of retired like NASA and Boeing engineers so this is like their retirement job yeah. um and yeah. basically they you know look at like you we have to like send the documents and whatnot before we like do the stuff and um you know, they then look at it and tell us if we're stupid or, you know, we're not, and then, you know, how to, so, so it's like, they, they are, are pretty, pretty good at, uh, 
you know, helping us kind of clean up the edges. Uh, for, yeah. At the first site itself, we, I mean, there are, there's a range safety officer on site. Just and to, a pyrotechnic operator. Yeah, yeah, to make sure, for pyrotechnics at least, that we are operating these potentially flammable substances, potentially explosive substances safely. And that's what all the, these like pressure relief valves are for. They require these, and so we use them to make sure that if anything does go wrong, we can release all the all the pressure from the system vent our propellants safely without people nearby. And mm -hmm. then in terms of range safety, um, they require, say, visually that the sky is clear. Uh, the airspace is pretty restricted, and so it's pretty much make sure there are clear skies so that you can visually see there are no planes or any aircraft in the, in the vicinity. And where all else fails, um, also just where we all are during this, is they have uh, concrete and then earthwork bunkers. Um, so it's like... Um, you know, it, it's like, you know, it's a, it's a really good place to fail. <laughs> yeah. How do you deal with the long-term, like, continuity? Like, I imagine an organization, like, you have people come and go, experience comes and goes. Like, yeah, that, it's hard. It's, def it's difficult. Like um, one thing that we've done, which has worked very well for us, actually, is um, doc setting up a platform that is called Confluence, which we use for documenting everything. Um, it's basically like a, a internal wiki kind of. Um, it's much better than Google Drive because it, it allows you to kind of organize documentation in the hierarchical structure that you don't really get from Google Drive. Um, but since implementing this like a year and a half ago, um, we've built it out with all of the knowledge that we've gained from all of this testing we've done. So um, when future members come in, um, they can go and read all this fantastic documentation we put together. Um, the other thing is that like, like I said, we don't have an intro project for our members, right? So when new members come onto the team, they're instantly working on something that's going to go on the flight vehicle. And that's very useful for continuity. Um, and, and I would just say that the third thing is we have fantastic leads who are just good at teaching people. And I mean, again, we're always working on this and trying to improve it, but, um, you know, delegating things to people so they can learn how to do it. Um, yeah, I don't know. We're teaching our replacements, essentially, and just... As a club, yeah, uh, I was going to say, if I, sorry if I missed it, but are you, yeah. the leads, are they, are you like a more permanent fixture? Yes, yeah, so we have our sort of, if you mean like team structure, we have our exec board, which is like the president, the safety officer, and the uh, chief engineer. And then below that, we have our sub team leads, so prop structures, sims, avionics. And they're re-elected every year. Yeah, and okay. so we hold elections for the execs and then the Sub team leads are basically based on technical expertise, uh, people who are able to handle these sub teams and manage that work. Right? So when you guys graduate, it's kind of left to the next level. Right? Yep. Yeah, that's yeah. difficult. And, and to be like more specific on the delegation system, we also have confluence linked up with like Jira. So for all of these specific things, we're like, um, you know, making tickets for work and whatnot. And so we're able to like see, we're able to sort of distribute the load more evenly than if it were just like, you know, a couple of people doing all the all the work. Like we're basically able to make like assignments for people. Yeah. yeah. Things that um that going back to your your last last December um, that you had um, OF ratio problems and hot fire tests. I thought you worked those out, and I think you saw that again. Like, can you tell what your hypothesis or hypotheses are for who caused that? <laughs> so a lot of our issues with getting the expected performance out of our engine stems from actually the dump loaded pressure regulators that we used to pressurize our tanks. And so characterization of sort of setting these regulators to a pressure and actually getting that pressure downstream is an extremely arduous process uh, in terms of sims. We can collect all the empirical data that we want, but sometimes uh, things don't perform as expected. These regulators aren't necessarily meant for like a rocket. They're not, so. they're, they're very, they're, they're static. Basis. Yeah, and they're also like, um, they're non-linear. So like if you're, flow, yeah, they're just, they're very hard to work with. So getting the OF ratio we want is very difficult. And that's actually one of the main reasons we did have these hot fires. Yeah, and so we've sort of addressed this by getting rid of these double loaded regulators. Exactly. And they're so now right. next mm -hmm. system you're good to is using a PID controlled uh, pressure regulation system, which is really just the ball valve that is opening and closing very quickly with controls just to regulate pressure in a tank at a constant rather than setting it beforehand and hoping that it sort of travels along a constant. And we actually did hot fires with this, this electronic system and we've shown twice now that we can get very flat pressure curves versus like our previous regular dome load regulators, we have like wild pressure curves throughout the burn. So and, and like not only that, also like less pressure loss through yeah. the system. Um, it's just like a lot more efficient. Cool. It also costs a lot less. <laughs> That's cool.
Yeah. Yeah. How often does Seb either communicate or collaborate with other rocket teams, either at MIT or UMich and mm -hmm. other other schools? Yeah. So occasionally we'll have teams reach out to us to sort of set up uh, either design reviews or just uh, ways to talk to them about engine design and various system level designs. Um, and so, as an example, next week, uh, talking to UC Davis about some of their injector designs and testing. Um, and something else I guess I can talk about specifically is like um, stuff like uh, that we've like done really well on like our like igniter fixture. Like I've had people like reach out to me personally and be like, you know, um, that we are now using this igniter fixture uh, for our things. We put a lot of our stuff online. Like when you look up liquid five propellant rocket igniter fixture, like, you know, you'll see like our design and, you know, our, our like, uh, you know, procedures for it and how to assemble it and so on and so forth. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's like sort of like just being generous with our knowledge, um, is I guess the main thing. And finding other teams who are generous with their knowledge and reading all, reading up on what they do. And out of curiosity, who's winning this, the collegiate space race? So right now for liquid rocketry, it's UCLA, um, with their 22,000, uh, liquid rocket. Um, we're yeah. catching up though. We are catching we've up. We've been around a lot shorter time than they have, and we've already launched our first liquid rocket, which not many colleges have done. Yeah, if you were to put us on like a graph, they'd be like, you know, like kind of going on, and we're like, well, we're going to go there. Yeah, we're, uh, we work quickly. We 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 uh, a two hour drive, I guess, or a three hour drive, an eight hour drive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. they're luckier a little bit. They also have an aerospace department. It's currently everything. Yeah, they're so bougie. They have like an entire, like, they have an entire trailer that like has their name on it, and you see us like rolling. They have their own workshop. <laughs> Like, like we, 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 we literally like there's a hot fire where like our entire system we after our entire system is like a minivan and like, yeah, yeah. it's like it's uh, it's like uh it's uh, you know you can do a lot more with less sometimes yeah <laughs> for your space it's rff luckily we we okay perhaps <laughs> It, it like, has holes in it, but it, like mostly the part we work has a roof, right? But it's very open to the wind on the other side. Well, no, we actually we actually recently took up on ourselves that uh, we patched up okay. our, our side. Yeah, we um, some like plastic. But but as you know, we order the dirt storage uh, section, and the dirt storage uh, is kind of doesn't totally have full to it. I don't know. Yeah, we we order where the UC stores all it's like dirt. Um, I guess it's good for ventilation. It's like a bunch of barrels of like dirt and stuff. So like a lot of it, so they study cement or something. Yeah, so like understandably they don't really care about the the, the roof on their on their dirt. So um, that, like, that hasn't been maintained in a while. <laughs> yeah, it's like I don't think we're meeting any uh cleanliness uh standards for our, you know, any anything at all. Yeah. yeah. So you you mentioned that you had your airframe fabricated by some place called HP Labs. So um presumably that's some company around here so it's sort of corporate sponsorship in kind sort of so okay basically it's like a little more nuanced than that okay so we basically like designed the entire thing uh just to be like 3d printed um and so hp labs like they're like you know hewlett packard there in palo alto basically it started through like a like a research uh thing it's like they, they actually we never signed paperwork that said like oh we're, we're sponsoring you now basically um, he's now graduated now, but, uh, one of my, uh, like, you know, friends, Andrew Chen, uh, was doing research with, um, in the, in Professor Gu's additive manufacturing lab, um, on campus. And they were working with the HP labs and basically over the course of like, um, sort of, uh, I guess the spring semester of last year, um, we just kind of like started like putting, you know, like sort of sneaking in little like airframe sections into their prints. And then them. like eventually, <laughs> Eventually, we ended up with like a full airframe, and then we launched it, and then we gave the HP Labs a presentation on it, and then and then they were like, "Holy crap!" First of all, where did this come from? How can we do more of it? And, and that, that's just sort of how that happened. All right. It was not if we had like emailed them, they definitely would not have said yes. We get like buckets of these. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, if you want to see one of the pieces we printed, it's right here. I have like a picture of like what a typical hall looks like from like uh you know it's like uh the amount of parts that you can fit into. Like it basically be these printers, um, multi jet fusion printers. They basically use like the HP inkjet tech to. They have like a reflective, um, like IR reflective and an IR absorbent ink that they lay over like a strip of nylon, and then they um, cure it with a uh, IR lamp indiscriminately. So you basically for every time interval, you're printing like an entire XY plane of parts. You can like 
you know, do like some like crazy Russian nesting doll type of stuff with like, you know, the way you're making your parts and you can fit like literally hundreds of parts into one build. It's like, so, you know, it's like for making stuff like this, it kind of like, it completely changes the game. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, wait, what was that super long question you said you had huh? for the end? Or wait, did you not say that? I thought you said you had a question that you were going to say. Yeah, until everyone else. No, you, yeah, I, I, get you, I see, I see, I see. Yeah. Okay, cool, cool. No, you answered it. It was good. Um, and then just a, a gearhead question, the, the dry and wet mass of Eureka 1? Yeah, so dry mass was 63 kilograms, wet mm -hmm. mass was 89 per kilogram. Yeah, that's another thing about E2 is it will have a higher fuel percentage of the, the vehicle because that's really like, like for like larger, like, you know, orbital class vehicles, like, like 95%. You know, it's like, like the comical amount of it is just like fuel. It's, so it's like, you, you know, we're like, it's, it's harder to do that for a smaller scale rocket when you're relying on like, you know, like commercially available things instead of custom manufacturing everything. And it's kind of like an overhead, like you have to have a constant amount of plumbing and fittings and tubes and stuff. Mm -hmm. But once you, like, as you make the propellant tanks bigger and bigger, that ratio goes down or up or whatever. But like you get more of the mass as fuel rather than like rocket. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the the 100 kilometers, that's 300,000 foot roughly. Yes. So, yeah. so the jump, you know, you guys are going to do a factor of two or three jump. Yeah. Eureka 2, and then it's a factor of 10 jump. <laughs> How much bigger of a rocket or different of a rocket are you going to need? We were just debating that last night, actually. So we've been doing a lot of sims. Um, it's like probably something around 16 inches in diameter. Uh, in diameter, probably something like around 30 some feet tall. So it's like, it's actually like, like in terms of rocket, like not like, you know, an, like 10 times bigger. Um, it's more so like like Andrew was saying, like the bigger your rocket is, the more percentage it is fuel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, luckily as altitude, you increase altitude say, say by 10 times, but your overall like impulse, your energy you need to carry with that system doesn't increase by 10 times. It only increases by say three or four. And mm -hmm. so luckily um, that helps us because mm -hmm. we can scale up and reach much higher altitudes with less like marginal yeah. increase of system size. And we're like simulating those numbers based on like essentially stock that's like commercially available for like tubes and stuff and like actually, you know. Yeah, it's not just theoretical. Like, like we like, found materials we can buy off the shelf that will work for these simulations. Yeah, because yeah. like we're not realistically gonna be able to, you know, make any anything we want. Like we're, we're still like very much constrained by like, you know, what we can like buy on McMaster, um, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh. All right. Good. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, that's everything. Yeah, thank you guys so much for having us. Hey.